Hi, everybody. So welcome back to our second session of today. Um, I'm joined here with our speaker, Dr. Hannah Critchlow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you uh, on sorry, this Sunday audio afternoon. files for the um, presentation. Oh, hello from Hope in Australia. Hi, Hope. Uh, I've actually just been in Australia. I was um, kind of trapped there during the pandemic. It was fantastic. Um, I was, yeah, it was basically trapped in paradise. But um, I'm now back in England uh, in time for... Christmas <laughs> with my family, which is good. Okay, um, so we're going to be talking about um, fate and free will this afternoon um, and how we may have been predetermined beha to behave in particular ways based on our, the biology of our brain. Um, hello, Liz from Glasgow, uh, and also from, to Angela from Bremen, Germany. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you have questions at all during this session, then please do write them down because there's lots of time at the end, towards the end of the session, uh, for a lovely um, Q&A discussion. Um, so please do write down any questions that you might have or any points that you might want to discuss further. Okay, so our brains are, um, I think, particularly wonderful. Uh, so they've got around 86 billion nerve cells in them. How do we know that's 86 billion nerve cells? Because it's quite a specific number, isn't it? Well, it was uh, primarily assumed that we had around 100,000 nerve cells. And I think someone just basically, a scientist, has kind of just randomly extrapolated the size of our brain uh, after counting a smaller model organism's brain and kind of extrapolated up and said, well, I think we roughly have that. But um, in the last 10, 15 years, some researchers decided to take some brains um, from some people that had died and had donated their bodies for medical research. They took their brains and they, um, whilst they were still fresh, uh, they took the whole brain and they basically put it in a blender with a little bit of uh, liquid and made a brain broth, <laughs> this kind of murky liquid. And then they um, pipetted out a particular volume, a specific volume of this brain broth and put it under the microscope and counted how many nerve cells were in that volume. And they did that a few times and then they extrapolated up from that. Uh, and they did this with a few different people and they found that the number of nerve cells that we have in our brains is 86 billion. So that's about 14 times the number of people on this planet. It. And each one of these nerve cells um, looks a little bit like this. You can see these brightly coloured, I don't know, they look a little bit like trees, I think. Um, these brightly coloured, it's almost a forest. I like to think of our mind being composed of a forest of nerve cells. So at the base here is the cell body, which contains the DNA, the genes that direct how that cell is going to behave. Um, and then extending out from that cell body is a big long axon like structure which is almost like a um, tree trunk um, and it's quite long and it's wrapped in fat and that fat called the myelin sheath helps to protect it we're going to be discussing that a little bit later um, and then extending out from that axon is an arbor dendritic harbour, um, which then kind of has lots of branch points in it. And you can also see that at the base of the cell body at the bottom, there's lots of arborizations as well. There's lots of branch points. And these branch points are really important because they allow each nerve cell, so each one of those 86 billion nerve cells to connect up to on average around 10,000 others. And so that creates a circuit board and I'm going to call it, I call it a circuit board for reasons that will become clear soon. Um, a circuit board in your mind with around 100 or 86 trillion connections. So 86 trillion connections in your mind. Um, and it's this connectivity, the way that that brain is wired up together with these, this very intricate, dynamic uh, kind of um, circuit board that allows us to think the way, in the way that we do. It allows information to come in from our external world, world through our senses, so through our eyes or through our ears or sense of touch and sense of balance, um, and send that information into electrical information because it activates the first nerve cell in the circuit, which causes a zip of electricity, which is um, sodium and potassium ions, which are basically being pumped in and out of that axon-like structure at high speeds to create an electric circuit. Uh, the passage of ions, so an electric circuit um, of around 120 miles per hour, zipping along that axon of the nerve cell and the fat wraps around it to help to ensure that that electric circuit can maintain its integrity and travel so fast. It's really important, this fat. Um, and it goes to the end, it gets to the end of the branch and then it dissipates, the electrical energy dissipates and releases a chemical 
and that chemical then electrically activates the next nerve cell in the circuit board. And this is how we think, this is how we behave, by using this, this mode of communication of sodium and potassium ions being pumped with huge power across those axons in our mind to create our emotions and even our memories um, and, and to dictate how we react to the world. Um, so it's an incredibly uh, complicated organ with all of these connections. And, and some centuries ago, a new field of cartography started. So mapping not the oceans or the land or the skies, but instead trying to map this circuit board of our nervous system. And first of all, scientists were interested in mapping the circuit board of the nervous system in the body because that was thought to be a little bit simpler. So you can see how they, those, these electrical impulses can then innovate the muscle to cause us to move. Um, but then maybe 20 years ago, scientists wanted to study um, how the, the circuit board in our mind um, operates. And so they started to try and map that. And we've made quite a lot of progress mapping the human connectome, as it's called. So that's what it's called, this field of cartography that's trying to map the human mind to see how it gives rise to behaviour, how electrical impulses travel across it to give rise to all of our different emotions and our memories and our sensations. So this study of human connectomics um, has really taken off over the last 10 years. Um, and so much so that this image here on the bottom right hand side of your screen, that is actually um, it's incredible new technology that stemmed out of uh, researchers that are working at King's College of London. And they're working as a consortium um, with many other scientists across Europe as part of an EU funded project. They're looking at the developing human connectome. So they're able to now map the connectome of a baby's brain as it's developing in situ. And they're able to image that baby's brain um, as the nerve cells, those 86 billion nerve cells that we're born with. So as we emerge into the world, those are the nerve cells that we're born with and they start to map, um, map themselves together when they're in utero. And this creates the foundations for thought for that baby as it's going to emerge into the world and become an individual. And so they're able to image through the amniotic fluid and correct for any movement that the baby might be making as it's wiggling around in the mummy's tummy and start to create a developing baby connectomics map. And we're gonna return back to this point in a little bit. But I, so, so this introduction slide is really just to say that um, we've got these new technologies that are allowing us now to peer into the brain as never before. And we're starting to see how huge swaths of our complex behaviours have a biological basis. As we understand more about the organ of the brain, we start to see and start to understand exactly how it creates the complex uh, complexities of our behaviours um, and shapes how we perceive our world and our sense of reality as well. And so as we learn more about the biology of this organ, the space for us to believe in free will becomes rapidly smaller, it's diminishing, it's getting smaller. And we have to start to accept that actually biologically we are predisposed to behave in particular ways. Um, so at the same time as uh, uh, us understanding more about the biology of our brains, we've also been able to start to map and sequence another part of our bodies, and that's the DNA. So the genes that are in pretty much every one of our cells within our brain and within our body. There's about three or 32. My connection is all good. I'm glad you clicked. Connection's good, Leonie. Um, oh dear, does, Amy's saying, does it keep freezing and lagging every so often for anyone else? Hopefully this is okay for most of you. And my connection's okay. And it's not freezing. All good here, that's good, okay. Um, yep, yeah, Monica's okay. I think uh, perhaps Amy um, might need to get closer to the router. Good, okay. Um, someone suggested, uh, so Neil suggested it might be worth leaving, leaving and then rejoining Amy. Hopefully that might help. Um, okay, so uh, we've also started to um, map and sequence the 3.2 billion base pairs that makes up uh, our DNA. So this coding system is unique to every single one of us. 
um, and it codes for around 20,000 genes. Um, and it's estimated that a third of those genes within our DNA are actually ex genes that are expressed within our brain. Um, so that's, that's a high proportion of the genetic material which is relevant to our brains and our behavior. And what we can start to see is that there's a high number of traits uh, that, that have a high biological basis. So there's traits that you probably already presumed might be down to the DNA that our mum and our dad gave us um, you know, through the sperm and their egg. Um, so, for example, things like height or eye colour or even body mass index, so our obesity levels, that has a high heritability. So heritability is the uh, proportion of variance that's down to our genetics. Um, and you can see there that the heritability of our height, eye colour and body mass index is around 75 to 80 percent. But what about more complex behaviours? So, for example, uh, our predisposition to particular medical conditions. And obviously, um, researchers have been, for the moment, really focusing, prioritizing, looking at heritability levels for conditions, brain conditions, uh, where they can help patient populations. So the focus has really been on medical need, uh, really, um, currently. So they've been looking at autism, for example, which is thought to have a heritability of around 80%. There's some studies that indicate that it's around 90%. Um, or schizophrenia, which is 75, but even intelligence is thought to have a heritability of an estimated 50%. Even socioeconomic status or beliefs, so that's ideology or religiosity, thought to have a heritability of 30%. Major depressive disorder, 35. Longevity, so how long we live, is thought to have a heritability of 25%. And our resistance to mental ill health, 20%. So these are fairly high percentage points uh, where we're discovering that genes are implicated in complex behaviors. And things like, for example, uh, when we look at intelligence, um, it's not one or two or three genes, it's thousands of genes that are working in tandem. And the majority of these genes seem to be implicated in dictating how those nerve cells are uh, set to connect up and how they're going to operate in the baby's brain. So how that neural circuit is formed in the first place. And quite a lot of the genes are also then involved in dictating how that neural circuit is going to operate throughout the rest of their life and the metabolic requirements of it. Um, because the brain actually consumes about 20% of the daily energy quota. And the reason that it needs so much energy is because it takes a lot of energy in order to pump those sodium and potassium ions continually in and out of those um, that nerve cell membrane to create that electrical zip of um, uh, information uh, so that we can process information from the outside world and try to make sense of it. Um, so there's really complex traits which have a high genetic basis to them and those genes are generally involved in paving the neural circuitry for the baby in the womb um, and then dictating how that neural circuitry is going to continue to operate throughout life. And in really interesting developments, if we go back to this image that's been created by these uh, researchers at King's College London, this image here on the bottom right hand side of your um, slide, um, what they found is that there's correlations between the genes that predispose to conditions like autism or schizophrenia or uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. So then these might be uh, conditions that might not emerge for decades down the line in that individual, but they can see anatomical signatures which correlate with the genes which predispose for these behaviors in the babies. So there's some indication there, there's an anatomical indication there that these individuals might be at risk, I suppose you might say, of developing these conditions down the line. So again, this, this hints towards this idea, uh, or strongly suggests towards this idea, that um, we have a high amount of our traits, our behaviours, have this biological underpinning. Um, and again, it's to do with how that neural circuitry, those 86 billion nerve cells, are put together and constructed in the baby's um, womb. Um, okay, so I've got a question from Chris saying, how do they measure these heritable, her heritable abilities? Uh, so we go back, oh, well, 
yeah, if we go back, um, I can actually, I can illustrate that with the next slide, Chris, I think. <laughs> Hopefully this will help, yeah, help make sense. So it's a good question. I think we're gonna come on to that now. Um, okay, so one of them that I was really interested in is thinking about how something like ideology, how a belief system, um, in this in this um, case, a political belief could be pre-wired, could be, what's the, what's the evidence that there's a biological underpinning for this? And there's been quite a lot of studies recently looking at the biological basis for ideology. And and the most um, interesting study, I think, in terms of the power of it, is this one. So it studied 12,000 twin pairs over five different democracies across the world um, and sampled this data over the course of four decades. And what they found was that there's a 30% heritability for ideology. Um, and again, it wasn't one or two or three genes, it was thousands of genes working in tandem. And the majority of these genes were ones that were involved in dictating how that neural circuit was paved down uh, in the baby and how it was going to function later on in life. There's another study which kind of uh, looked specifically at one of these candidate genes and they wanted to tease apart how nature and nurture could um, intertwine in this really complicated facet of our behavior, which is political ideology. So they looked at one particular gene, which is the DRD47R, um, and this allele of the gene has been associated uh, with novelty-seeking behavior. Now, a little bit about DRD4, um, it's dopamine um, 4 receptor. Now, dopamine is involved in um, feelings of pleasure and motivation and reward. And some people um, might, seek out uh, pleasure and reward more than others they, they they get more motivation from it and there's a reason that people some people are like this within our population because it, it help it's it's helpful when we go back to uh, our days of evolution when we were on the savannah we did need to have people out there who, that were highly motivated to go and forage and hunt for food um, and they had they got that motivation by having uh, by getting a lot of intense pleasure from feeding <laughs> And so it was helpful back in the day in evolutionary days for us to have those types of people um, within our environment. Um, and what they found is that if you had a particular variant of this gene uh, and you had a high number of friends when you were growing up, um, you were much more likely to um, have a liberal political ideology. Um, and the opposite was true if you didn't have this, um, if you did have this uh, genetic variant, but only had a, a small number of diverse social interactions or exposure to different groups of people when you were young, then you were more likely to be of the conservative um, ideological bent. So, uh, so really interesting to see how our early years experiences in terms of friendships uh, that we might be exposed to and our genes can actually interact to give rise to something uh, which is a quite a complex behavioural trait um, that emerges for our life, um, during our adult lifespan. Um, there's also some really interesting uh, studies uh, for example, looking at brain imaging. Um, so using MRI to image the brains and trying to find different volumes of different regions or different circuits and pathways within the brain and how that might correlate with ideological uh, behavioral phenotype. And what they found, so they studied 90 young adults. Um, so these are adults that are in their 20s, uh, generally speaking, and they looked at two particular um, brain regions. Well, they looked across the brain, but they found two particular brain regions that were statistically significant in terms of differences uh, for ideology. And that's the amygdala. So the amygdala is a very important brain region. It's involved in our fear response um, and the anterior cingulate cortex, which is another brain region here, which is uh, kind of further towards our, our forehead. You can see it being lit up here. Hopefully you can see my mouse. This is the anterior cingulate cortex, and this is the amygdala here. So this is the brain region that's involved in the fear response. And the anterior cingulate cortex is involved more in future um, kind of horizon scanning and thinking how we can creatively collaborate with other people and problem solve into the future. So this brain region here, and the amygdala, is much more involved in the here and now, feeling fear and concern for the here and now. Whereas this region is thinking more about creatively and innovatively problem solving into the future. And there's always at any point in our existence, there's a balancing act going on between how we've got to feel safe and secure for the here and now and how we can think towards the future for not only our own individual success, 
uh, you know, years, decades down the line, but also our descendants as well, how they're going to um, kind of cope in, in future days. So there's a balancing act between this here and that now and the future. And what they found was that um, those people that had a more conservative bent had a much larger greater uh, gray volume it's called so that's more connectivity more branching of those nerve cells um, many more nerve cells connecting to many other nerve cells within the amygdala so and, and more activity more sensitivity in this amygdala as well so those people with the conservative bent were much more um, concerned with fear for the here and now whereas those people of a more liberal um, persuasion um, were had a much larger area and much um, greater connectivity in the anterior cingulate cortex. And they could actually then take this, this idea that you could look at volumetric measurements of distinct brain volumes, and they took another data set, another group of volunteers from their study, imaged their brains, and they were able to predict their po um, political bent with 72% accuracy, which is not a bad accuracy field for such a complex trait. So what we're seeing increasingly is that there is this biological predisposition for even complex traits like ideology. Um, and when you think about it, it's really, it's, it makes sense that these behaviours are rooted deep within us, within evolutionary conserved brain regions um, that have been important for our species survival. And it's important, I also want to say, that maybe we think of, um, so as, as we're living in a world where there seems to be increased polarisation between different tribes of people, um, actually, I think it's, it's quite useful for us to think that both types of people are important for our species success. So you want a certain proportion of the population to be concerned about the here and now. Um, and you do also want a certain proportion of the population to be thinking about the future and collaborative, in innovatively problem solving. So both types of behaviours uh, have probably been integral for our species success throughout evolution. And so rather than um, having kind of increased polarizations and echo chambers uh, and division between these groups of people. I think actually it will be, it will be important for us um, to, to stop that polarization and to start appreciating the cognitive diversity that's on offer. And there's a reason that we have this very complex uh, brain system that can produce all of these very different nuanced types of behaviors um, through this incredible cartography of the 86 trillion nerve cells. Um, you know, and, and the, our ability to produce all these different behaviours has been very important uh, for our species' um, success and our evolution throughout our history. Okay, so we've talked about ideology, but is there any other type of um, very complex behaviour that might have a, a hefty um, biological predisposition? Well, I really like this, uh, this study. This is the work of Robin Dunbar. He's a professor at Oxford University, and he's the one that came up with the Dunbar, Dunbar social brain hypothesis. So he's come up with the idea that um, the uh, average human um, has the capacity within their brain to have a friendship group of around 150 people. Um, and past 150 people, then basically you just you don't have the cognitive resources to maintain, to have to, to to, to put the energy into understanding that other person and maintaining that relationship. Um, what he's come up with when he looks at different species uh, and different species friendship uh, styles is that there's a correlation between the size of the neocortex, which is kind of around about here, relative to the rest of the brain. So as the ratio of the neocortex compared to the volume of the rest of the brain increases, we're able to maintain more friendship uh, with a higher number of people. Um, and I'm going to go on in the second part of um, this talk to talk about why that's important. This, having that friendship group and that, uh, that access to that diversity of thinking styles is important for our species. Um, and it ties in very much with this idea that, that we have uh, less free will than we might like to think. Um, okay, so, uh, he also um, came up with this idea that there's difference in um, so-called extroverts or introverts, and you can predict um, the different social styles uh, from brain scans. 
So again, um, what they looked at is a, the volume of a particular area of the medial prefrontal, medial orbital prefrontal cortex, so kind of round about here, um, and it's a region of the brain that's involved in social interactions. Um, and they found that there was a correlation between theory of mind and the volumes of this particular area. And what he came up with the idea of is that um, if you've got a larger volume of the medial orbital prefrontal cortex, then you basically have more beta endorphin slots within that greater volume of area. And so you, if you have that higher volume and you have more beta endorphin uh, receptor slots, then you are driven to go around and interact with a certain number of people almost each day or each week, say, in order to feel satisfied. You have that desire that's biologically rooted into you, so you have to have interaction with other people um, in order to feel satisfied. And what he's come up with the idea of, and, and I really like this, is that um, those people who are more introverted, so they have a slightly smaller uh, volume of re uh, this region and slightly fewer of these beta endorphin receptors, um, and so they have less drive to go and interact with other people, they invest more of their energy in maintaining relations, very close relations, with a smaller number of people. So they have a smaller friendship group, but they spend more energy, more cognitive reserve on each one of those uh, kind of relationships. So they're very important for creating that village, that village of support that helps our species to um, kind of thrive for future descendants. But then what's also important is that you don't become this kind of parochial clique within that small village that offers each other support. And so this is where the extroverts come in. They have the larger volume of this particular brain region. They've got many more beta endorphin receptor slots. And so they have this drive to go and interact with many different people. And so they act um, by helping to uh, kind of create, let ideas spread from one little introvert village and hop across to the next introvert village. So they allow innovation and ideas to spread between what could otherwise be parochial, vill parochial villages. So again, both types of people, very important for our species success. And there's a biological underpinning uh, that helps to explain why certain people are wired to behave in particular ways. Um, okay, so I kind of feel like we've done um, ideology and um, we've done social styles uh, which are quite complex uh, behaviors um, but obviously it's not the case that when you were a baby uh, the genes that your mum and dad gave you uh, kind of created you and that's it for life you know you're set off on one particular trajectory and there's no scope for change uh, at all um, that's not the case so I did my PhD actually looking at something called brain plasticity. So how our brains change as we learn and remember from the outside world. So how different environments can shape, can sculpt that human connectome of those 86 trillion connections. And so what happens as we learn something from our environment is that a new little, philip it's called a philopodia, is like a little worm-like structure. And it reaches out from one nerve cell branch reaches out to the next one, to the next nerve cell, and forms a connection with it. And that's learning from our environment. And as that learned thing gets consolidated, more and more receptors, so NMDA or AMPA receptors, get recruited to the head of this little philopodia worm. And so it becomes more shaped like a mushroom. It's called a mushroom dendritic spine. And then this is now a consolidated memory spine. And this allows electrical information to pass between the nerve cells uh, in that new circuit that's just been formed as a result of environmental change. And so all of this connectivity changes, this plasticity, this learning and memory happens all the time within our brains. Um, so it happens at a higher rate when we're much younger, but even in our brains when we're a bit older, um, we have this, this scope for plasticity. So we can continually learn afresh from our environment uh, and that can affect the way that we interact with it and we behave with it. And there's a lovely video here that I want to show you, um, which is basically the making of memories. So this blows me my mind every single time I see it. So it's a video uh, of 15 minutes um microscopy looking down at uh, nerve cells that are growing in a dish 
And these white blobs, which are shuttling along a little bit like cars along a traffic system, are basically um, proteins that are involved in that NMDA or AMPA receptor, the, the learning and memory connections within the brain. So these are proteins that are key for that stable learning and memory process. And they're being shuttled along those, um, those dendrites, that, those branches, those arborizations of our mind to help create new connections and new pathways in our brain so that we can start to think in different ways. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to this. Um, so we can obviously change our, um, change our brain's anatomy, change our connectome in response to the things that we experience from our environment. So it's obviously not the case that our brain is set in stone and our life trajectory is completely set from the moment that we're born based on the genes that our mum and dad gave us and the way that our connectome has been um, kind of created when we were a baby. There is still scope for change from our environment on a daily basis. But there's a lovely little video here that helps us to understand how limited um, that ability to change actually is. Because I told you earlier that our brains use about 20% of our daily energy quota. Um, so they're greedy, hungry beasts, our brain. But they're also quite lazy things, our brains. They like to make assumptions because it's using all this energy all the time. So in some ways, we kind of have this protective mechanism that's inbuilt into our brain so that we don't blow a fuse, if you like. Um, and so we constantly ignore information from the outside world based on our prior experiences. So we make assumptions, we have shortcuts in our information processing so that we can quickly create our sense of reality on a, on a, in a real time, second by second basis and choose how to react with it. So we basically see the world based on the prism of our experiences that have come before. And that can lead to some wrongful assumptions in the way that we view the world. So we actually get inaccurate representations of the world because of that. And this is linked to us having cognitive biases uh, or, or attentional deficits, if you like. Okay, so let's have a look at this. So this is a hollow mask. Uh, and as we get to the back end of the mask, the shadows are telling you that the nose and the eyes and the mouth are actually going backwards but your brain is ignoring that shadow information cue and instead you're seeing another face popping forward. So we'll get back uh, to the other side of this mask in a second. So again, the shadows are telling you that it's the back end of a mask, but your brain is ignoring that shadow information and just presuming that it's another face that's coming forwards. So you, your brain is just making assumptions based on the fact that you're used to seeing faces in your environment rather than the back end of a mask. And there is another illusion that helps us to understand uh, this idea that we have um, problems with our processing in our brain. So if I go back. So what's happened there is that our brains have used that past experience of hearing the camels kept in the cage of the zoo and overlaid it onto the other file of geek gobbledygook that has a similar cadence. And this auditory illusion, in much the same way that the visual illusion of the shadows and the back end of the mask, um, shows us that uh, our brains are constantly making assumptions based on our past experiences and trying to make sense of Okay, well, hopefully you can hear this. Hopefully you can hear that. Yeah? Yes. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the second file. Back at about five the camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage. Poor camel, you definitely could hit, understand that. And now we're going to go back to the, um, the original file, which was the gobbledygook, and see if you can make sense of this now. So your brain has overlaid that sense of the sentence, the camel was kept at the cage of the zoo onto the gobbledygook and made sense of it and made the wrong assumption that actually it's saying the camel was kept in the cage of the zoo. Um, 
that illusion probably didn't work for you, any of you, because I'd just been talking about the camel was kept at the cage of the zoo in the description of it, but you hadn't actually heard the file. <laughs> but from whenever you hear that file now of the gobbledygook all scrambled up, your brain will forever interpret it as the camel was kept at the cage of the zoo, just because your brain has made those connections um, that to make the assumptions that that kind of cadence actually creates the sentence, the camel was kept at the cage of the zoo. So this type of um it did work for danny great and it did work for ben brilliant um well, i'm glad that worked okay you got that um so this is an example of how your brain constantly makes um assumptions sometimes wrong assumptions based on our past experiences and so you can start to see that if your reality your perception of the world is being created based on this plasticity, this ability of our brain to make uh, new connections as we learn and remember from our environment. But it's doing that based on a false impression of our current reality, which is based on the foundation for thought of what's gone before, what we've experienced before. So you can start to see now when we combine that with all of the information that's coming out of the gene genetic studies and the connectomic studies, that actually as individuals, we might be veering towards an increasingly amplified state of what might be our biologically prescribed fate. So it's, it's so if you can basically, I'm asking you to kind of combine this idea that our perception, our sense of reality is based on this plasticity, which is uh, involved in our learnings and memories, but there's huge scope to make wrong assumptions there because of the metabolics of our brains. And that also we have this biological kind of um, predetermined nature that's based on how our neural circuitry is put together and the genetics that we were given from our mum and dad. And so that does create somebody that can change how they see the environment because of the plasticity, but it actually becomes quite difficult to change. Um, different ways that we see the world because of all the assumptions that our brains make. And you can see that, you know, if you're trying to break a habit that you're not very happy with, that you may have started to create in your life, it's really difficult. It's really tricky to do. And what they've also found is that, you know, the more a habit that has become entrenched in your social identity or um, more aspects of the routine of your daily life, the more difficult it is to change it. Because to do so, to make that change, would require widespread demolition and reconstruction construction work within the neural circuitry of your mind and sometimes that can be very difficult to do um, okay so hopefully that kind of gives us a little bit of understanding of how uh, our behaviors um, can be predetermined within our brains um, and there's another mechanism by which we start to understand how our behaviors can be predetermined within our brain and that's oh dear so there's a new, um, there's a brilliant new uh, field of research called epigenetics, um, which again is, a, is kind of a brand new area of science and particularly in relation to neuroscience. Um, but it neatly seems to suggest that there's another mechanism by which we can explain how nature and nurture are completely intertwined. And there's one study, which is a, just a standout study uh, that was published about 10 years ago, and it left the neuroscience community reeling because of the implications. So uh, now mice is a study that was done in mice, um, and it looks at this new field of research called epigenetics in relation to neuroscience and psychiatry. So mice usually love the sweet smell of cherries. So what happens when uh, a bit of uh, cherry smell uh, hits a, a mouse's nose is that it um, activates the olfactory receptor and it causes an electric signal to zip from the nose to the region of the brain, the nucleus accumbens, which is involved in feelings of pleasure and reward and motivation. And so that helps the mouse to scurry around in excitement. It's really motivated. It thinks that somewhere out there is some lovely cherries that it can nibble on. And so it gets excited and starts looking for them. Um, so that's the evolutionary ingrained response to this nice smell of um, cherries. Now, what a team of researchers in the States, in Kerry, Dias's, um, Kerry and Dias's lab did in America, is that they instead paired the um, sweet smell of cherries with a mild electric shock. And after a few iterations of this, the mice learnt to freeze in anticipation of an electric shock that was coming their way as soon as they smelt cherry. So it's a bit like the opposite of Pavlov's, Pavlov's dogs. Um, and so they, they learned that pretty quickly, as you would expect. So then what the researchers did is that they allowed these mice to have happy lives. 
So they didn't ever give them the smell of cherries again, and they didn't give them any um, nasty electric shocks. They left these rats, um, see these mice, sorry, to just have some nice, happy lives. And they had a family. They sat at home and had a family. Uh, and the pups also had a lovely life. No smell of cherries, no electric shocks. Uh, they had a lovely life and they had a family of their own as well. So now we're talking about the grandchildren of the original mice in the experiments. And what happened when they were exposed to the sweet smell of cherries? Well, it turns out that even though they hadn't experienced this electric shock, and even though presumably they hadn't had it communicated from their parents or from their grandparents, and the researchers actually um, controlled for this by fostering out some of the pups to other, um, other mice that, were, uh, that hadn't experienced any of this manipulation. Um, so there was no communication of the learnt uh, kind of experimental paradigm. What they found was that the grandchildren similarly were nervous and frozen anticipation were highly sensitive in a negative way to this smell of cherries. And when they looked at the brains, what they found is that this olfactory receptor activated by the um, sweet smell of cherries had rerouted itself from the nucleus accumbens, so the area of the brain involved in learning and involved in reward and um, motivation and feelings of pleasure. And it basically rerouted it from that brain region to the amygdala, so that area of the brain that we were discussing earlier that's involved in the fear response which is why these mice were now fearful so they would talk about the grandchildren so they found that actually there's um, a, a lovely uh, there's a lovely change that had occurred in uh, not the DNA per se of the um, gametes from the grandparents um, uh, sperm or egg so there hadn't been a change in the genetic code um, expressed in the gametes, but actually there was a change in the conformation of the DNA. So the shape of the DNA, which is all usually tightly packaged and coiled so that it can fit that massive uh, 3.2 billion base pairs of DNA into each gamete cell, um, that shape had actually changed a little bit. So enzymes could access that gene, the genes there in different ways. And that gene expression change then went on to affect the circuitry change in the children and the grandchildren children of the um, original mice in the study to explain the behavior. And there's some similar studies uh, looking at whether this type of mechanism could possibly hold true for humans. And I have to say this is preliminary research, but the results seem to indicate that, for example, this epigenetic way of changing the conformation, the shape of the DNA, um, as a result of an experience, can be passed on to descendants and ancestors down the line in humans and it might help to explain why for example uh, there's an increased mortality rate from US civilians that came home from the Civil War, um, why their descendants had a 10% uh, increased mortality rate by the time they're 40 and there's some fascinating work that's coming out of um, a lab in Israel uh, where they're looking at descendants of the Holocaust and they can see epigenetic changes in uh, the cortisol chemical that's involved in the stress response and these changes that are being passed on to descendants of the Holocaust. So, I mean, it's, uh, so I do have to stress it's early days for the field of epigenetics and psychiatry and behaviour, but the preliminary results do seem to be indicating there's something there. And, and this, this mechanism also provides a way that we can uh, try and tease apart and understand how nature and nurture aren't separate things and they're actually very much intertwined. Um, when you look at different organisms, so for example C. elegans, which are little worms, earthworms kind of thing, uh, very small little worms, um, they also have this epigenetic mechanisms and they can see that there's behavioural changes uh, as a result of epigenetic um, mechanisms that can last for up to 14 generations. So this, uh, this mechanism for passing memories cross generations can go on for 14 generations in this worm, the model organism, which is pretty cool. Okay, we're actually very much running out of time. I'm sorry, I've gone over. Uh, sorry about that. Um, and you're probably all needing the loo. Uh, <laughs> but um, oh, really, really quickly. So I'm gonna come on to that point for the next talk. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, and I'm gonna say, go and all enjoy a loo break. Um, yes. <laughs> I might have to switch the light on at some point soon. Um, okay, so what I wanted to finish with there um, uh, was this idea that, you know, 
if we each have this unique cartography of our mind made up of these 86 trillion connections and it's based on the genes that our mum and our dad gave us uh, and the way that that, that that genetic information dictated how our neural circuitry, how those 86 billion nerve cells are going to wire themselves up in our baby brain. And that also on top of that, there's these memories that have been sent packaged into the way that our genes are expressed. Memory memories that, of experiences that our ancestors had. So our grandparents and our great grandparents and many generations before us were also affecting the way that these genes are expressed and how that neural circuitry forms within our mind. So that gives each one of us on this planet a very individual, unique cartography of that mind, that each one of us has a very different human connectome. Um, hopefully everyone can uh, hear us. Okay, I'm seeing a couple of messages. Oh, that's from Lally and Neil. Yeah, so each one of us has a very unique and individual cartography of our mind. And it's this that dictates how we perceive the world um, and how we make our decisions and how we respond to it, how the, the emotional response that we have. Um, and sure, we can experience new things from the world around us and we can lay down new memories, but there's always this, this view of the world, which is, a result of the genes and the neural circuitry that we've been given from our ancestors. So if we accept that, and if we accept for this, this idea that the space for free will, free will is being rapidly diminished as we learn more and more about heritability and human connectomics, then we also have to accept that there is something in the strength of cognitive diversity that each one of us as individuals can contribute when we come together as a group. And there's some lovely, lovely studies that have been conducted by Professor Chris Frith and Professor Uta Frith who are at University College London. So what they were looking at is how we each of us, as you saw with those illusions from um, the mask and also the camel being kept at the cage of the zoo, that each of us make um, incorrect, inaccurate representations of the world based on our prior experiences. Um, but actually they did some lovely empirical studies looking at how when we're given the opportunity to discuss our version of reality with another person, and it can be a stranger or it can be a friend, then actually both people are much more likely to get towards a more representative reflection of reality than they were by themselves. So there's something in the power, the wisdom of the crowd. And that's because we each of us have our own unique cartography of the mind that sets us off to a particular destiny. But it's not really about the individual that's so important. It's how we can start to work together as a team. And so that's what I want to look at in the next talk. So this is my next book. Um, so I've, I've kind of touched on some of the research uh, that's been included within the science of fate, uh, the previous book. Um, but I've also in the last couple of years, because I was uh, kind of stuck in paradise in Australia um, because of um, COVID and flight cancellations, I was able to research my next book, which was on, ironically, because uh, I was kind of in isolation in um, Australia, uh, kind of separated from everybody that I know in the world, because they're on the other side of the world. Um, but ironically, in isolation, I um, kind of did my research, my next book on collective intelligence, so how brains can start to work together. Um, more effectively. So it's kind of a follow on from this idea of the science of fate. Um, so to kickstart that talk, I want to talk about how we can make wonderful decisions. So as a species, obviously, we've um, made great advances. So for example, healthcare systems, uh, exploration of space, some of the great monuments, the cathedrals, some of the great cultural uh, musical symphonies that have been created, uh, where audiences converge uh, to try and listen to these great pieces of um, great pieces of art and music, and their brain waves actually synchronize in unison as they're appreciating these, these beautiful works. Um, and there's also the construction of incredible uh, monuments dotted across the world um, that we all enjoy, uh, fantastic architecture. So there's many things that humans can do when we work together um, in a positive way. But on the flip side of that, there's also uh, our capabilities as species for some great atrocities. So in the last 10,000 years alone, it's been estimated that between, I've got it written down here, it's between 150 million and 1 billion people have died as a result of our species um, killing each other through war. 
Um, even more significant is that each year um, there's a minimum uh, kind of estimate that around 900,000 people kill themselves, they commit suicide each year. Um, so we, we can create great things when we're together, but we also have a dark side as well. There's a dark side to our hive mind. Um, so we're more fearsome really than the shark or a crocodile. We're more bloodthirsty uh, and we can be more negative towards our own species than any other species on this planet can be. Um, and I want to look at how we can start to nudge our behaviours using this idea of plasticity, accepting the fact that each one of us has a biological constraint or predetermined nature, if you like. But what can we do within environments to try and shift our decision making as a collective towards a more positive trajectory so that we're not going down this negative way that ultimately ends up in um, loss of life um, and other ways that can manifest itself in a negative way. So that's what I'm going to be focusing the second um, bit of the talk on is basically trying to work against that predetermined nature to see how we can nudge behaviours in a more positive way. And to start this examination, what I want you to do is um, close your eyes and pick up your, uh, your the hand that you write with and with your index finger of that hand I want you to write an E on your forehead, an E. So it can be a, um, can be a capital E or it can be a little E, so with your eyes closed. And I'm now going to ask you to do that with a different setting. So close your eyes and imagine that you're in a position of power. So imagine that maybe you're a judge on a high court uh, and your final decision will have massive repercussions for a particular case. Or maybe you're chairing a committee meeting or maybe you're the responsible person uh, for a family outing for the day or for, the, for a weekend. So you're in position of power and everybody else has to listen to you. So now again, I want you to take your index finger, close your eyes and write the letter, letter E whilst thinking of being in that position of power. I'm just feeling that emotion of being in power. Okay, and now open your eyes. So what researchers have found in different ways that they've conducted, conducted this type of experiment is that simply reliving or imagining being in a position of power increases egocentricity so you're more likely to see things from your own vantage point rather than from other people's so what the researchers have found in different series of many different experiments is that those people in a position of power were for example more likely to write e so it made sense for themselves but not for you for the person outside that might be looking but when you're thinking normally not in that position of power that you don't have this effect, that you're just looking at things from your own vantage point. So they found this again and again and again. So there seems to be something in it that simply being in a position of power has a corrupting effect on anyone. Okay, so what can we, what can we uh, kind of reveal from that? What can we see? Uh, what can we do to try and help protect our brain power so that our moral values uh, or the way that we can have empathy and compassion for other people can remain intact um, even if we are in a position of power? Well there's been some lovely studies uh, looking at how just simply immersing yourself in a good fiction book can help you to um, exercise your mirror neurons, so neurons in the um, brain that are thought to be involved in um, having empathy and being able to imitate uh, or think from another person's perspective. So immersing yourself in a really good engrossing novel uh, can seem to help that idea of um, thinking about other people. There's also, for example, what have you got the same each time? That's from Monica. Um, Oh dear, this is fascinating. For me, the opposite happened. Maybe I should be in a position of power. <laughs> I think Danny, maybe, yeah, maybe you're, you're already protected from the negative effects of power. So I did do that experiment slightly wrong. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have um, told you first to do it without imagining being in a position of power. So I kind of scrambled it up a bit, I'm afraid. But try it out on, uh, on family um, if you can. So just ask them to start from the starting point. Imagine being in that position of power. And what you'll probably find is that they do an E 
in a way that's the right way around for them, but not for other, other people. Um, okay, and there's also some lovely studies that have been conducted looking at how just simply volunteering can actually change the way that the brain uh, kind of circuits get activated so that you're increasing that empathy and compassion for other people and this can help protect against the feelings of power. Um, and there's some wonderful studies that have also been conducted by this uh, researcher called John Coates. Now, he used to be a trader on Wall Street back in the day, and he made lots and lots and lots of money. And he was looking around at the trade floor because that was when he was working back in the day. It was on, you know, on the busy trade floor that you kind of used to see in the movies. Um, I think nowadays people are more likely to be working from home. But um, so he used to work back in the day on Wall Street uh, trading floor, made, made piles of money. And he was looking around thinking, I don't think I'm like exceptionally intelligent. How come I've made so much? and he thought oh, do you know what I'm going to do with my money I'm going to take it and uh, go to Cambridge University and start studying this idea um, with the Cambridge Judge Business School and look at what is it that might be within my brain or other people's brain which helps us to make more money to have economic benefit. and what he found was that there was a particular area of the brain called the insula which is involved in recognizing other people's emotional states, but also recognizing your bodily emotional state. Now there's a really nice nerve, which is called the vagus nerve, which connects basically the brain to the heart and the gut and other internal organs. And there's a lot of information that comes into our brain from our senses, but doesn't get consciously processed. And it might get stored within our body without any conscious awareness. And the vagus nerve, seems to have a high sensitivity at detecting this information and bringing it to our conscious or even subliminal awareness. And this is what researchers are finding, is that the, the more sensitivity we have with this vagus nerve, the more it can convey that information that's stored within our body and bring it to our insula, and the more connectivity, these nerve cells that are connecting up to create this lovely gray volume kind of extensive forest system, if you like, within the insula, this region of the brain, the bigger that area it is, then the more uh, we can pick up on clues that are being emitted from other people around us all the time. So all the time there's information that's being emitted from people that um, we might not be consciously aware of, it's in our environment and that we might not be consciously aware of, but we can start uh, picking up on these cues with more sensitivity and selectivity. And what John Coates found was that actually this ability of ours to pick up on other cues from other people can have economic re repercussions. And in the case of the traders on the stock exchange, the more profits that they made within a particular 12 month period, it could be predicted from the size of their insula and the, um, and the, and the um, sensitivity of their vagus nerve innovation. Um, so it was a fantastic finding and there's a lovely researcher called Sarah Garfinkel who's working down at UCL now and she's looking at how we could all start to exercise this vagus nerve and the insula. And it's a really simple task which is basically spend time each day, it's almost you know meditating, um, and it's basically trying to tune into your body by listening to your heartbeat. And if you struggle to listen to your heartbeat, at the, you know, initially, which many people do, just run on the spot or do star jumps for a minute and then sit and listen to your heartbeat. So just sit in quiet and listen to your heartbeat. And she's getting some preliminary results to show that the more time we spend trying to pick up on these cues that might be stored within our body that have been given off from our environment and from other people, the more we might be consciously aware of it. So it's exercises like this, volunteering, immersing ourselves in the narrative of another person, looking people in the eyes, trying to make eye contact, which is quite difficult obviously over Zoom, um, and spending some time reflecting on information that we might not otherwise be consciously aware of that can help, we think, protect against the corrupting force of power, which gives rise to people thinking with more egocentricity um, and not really fully appreciating that they might be in a position of privileged information that other people might not have access to. Um, okay, 
So that's a really neat little um, trick that we can all use to try and help make um, kind of better decisions. But I want us to take a step back now and think about exactly how we make decisions on a day to day basis and as we go through our life. So uh, we've already covered in the first part of this um, talk that our brains are made of uh, these beautiful nerve cells which form this forest, if you like, in 3D structure that creates our brains. Um, and there's 86 billion nerve cells, uh, each one connected to around 10,000 others that creates this circuit board of around 86 trillion connections which sends electrical signals whizzing around at speeds of around 120 miles an hour in order for us to process the information from the outside world, give rise to our sense of reality and our perception of the world, give rise to our emotions and our memories and create how uh, we interact with the world around us, so to create our actions in the world and how we communicate with other people. Now, um, there's some lovely studies showing that uh, even though um, we uh, kind of have this unique cartography of the mind, we can change our brains and sculpt our brains um, that can affect in a way that can affect our decision making down the line. And that's through this biological uh, phenomenon called brain plasticity, which we talked about earlier. So new connections can form as a result of our environmental experiences, give rise to consolidated memories. And if we keep on revisiting those consolidated memories, they can become habitual um, kind of fast motorways in our mind that give rise to our everyday behaviors. Um, and it's through that act of repetition um, that we can consolidate that, that information highway within our mind and make it the most used route um, in habit of thinking. Um, which, but, but that sometimes can be difficult when there's cognitive bias in our brains that are kind of being conflicted with lots of information, bombarding our senses all of the time. Um, so there's a balancing act there to do. Um, so each of us has this very individualized cartography of the mind. Uh, which has this cognitive bias and this, but also this plasticity within our brain. Um, and we each have a slightly uh, inaccurate version of reality based on our past experiences and the genes that our mum and dad gave us. But it's when we combine our, and pool our cognitive uh, kind of diversity that we really get the full cognitive power that's on offer to our species. And there's this, this idea of the intelligence or the wisdom that's exhibited by a crowd of people is something that you can see today in, uh, for example, you know, Wikipedia or, or democracy to some degrees uh, <laughs> and, um, and other forms where people are able to edit and, and input their collective intelligence uh, and, and demonstrate it in some ways. Um, and there's some lovely studies that have shown uh, kind of, you know, what is it about a team that brings about success? So, for example, um, some researchers looked at over 2.1 million patents and over 20 million scientific uh, kind of publications to try and find out if there was a winning formula for the most successful team. So the most innovative team that were able to create highly cited papers that were accepted and uh, kind of um, celebrated in the scientific community and also gave rise to innovative intellectual patents as well. So went on to create something mean, meaningful, um, presumably. And what they found was the kind of winning formula was this idea that you need to have people, a diverse team of people. So it's not the idea of this lone genius working by themselves anymore. It's actually as things have become in our lives, become much more specialized, then you actually need uh, a team of people um, with atypical subject combinations. So they're working uh, on subject areas that span a great breadth. And so you're able to then dip into all of the different ways of thinking from these different types of people. So, um, and make the use of the different cartographies that their brains offer. And there's some lovely studies looking at how we can actually start to celebrate and identify and make the most of the cognitive diversity that's available to you and your team. So this could be your team that's available to you at work, or maybe even your friendship groups, or maybe even your family. For example so making the most of that cognitive that brain power that's on offer from that group of individuals so there's some differences in how we think that are due to our genetics so for example ADHD or autism um, has a high have both have very high heritable uh, con contributing factors um, 
And when you look at uh, some of the studies, there's some lovely work um, where software companies in particular are really aiming their recruitment um, kind of programs to try to recruit more people that have been diagnosed with autism because they have some strengths within their behaviours. So fine attention to detail, for example, um, and kind of practical uh, application for programming that that company would really like. People with ADHD, uh, Again, this goes back to this idea that I was talking about earlier about the dopamine receptor 7R subtype. Um, there's, some, there's some lovely studies that have shown that people with ADHD are more likely to be intrepid explorers. They might be taking you know, risks uh, and enjoying adventures and kind of thinking in new ways. Um, and they have been biologically driven to do this. And they were very important back in the day on the savannah when we needed people that would explore new areas and take risks. And today in the business world, similarly, it can be useful to have that person uh, within a team leading it at the initial innovation stage. So again, um, kind of recruiting people that have genetic diversity, differences in their genes that may give them different cognitive strengths can be a good thing to do. There's also experience diversity. Um, so for example, because uh, we talked earlier about this idea of synaptic plasticity, our experiences shaping our brain, sculpting uh, it due to new, new connections occurring as we learn and remember from the environment. Um, so there's a lovely uh, kind of um, way that I, I that my brain makes sense of this idea of experience uh, diversity. So back in the day, in the 1970s, um, primatologists were usually um, uh, males, bearded males that used to go out and watch the apes uh, and make presumptions and do scientific studies with their team of researchers. Um, and the, the scientists in charge would generally be these bearded men of a particular age, they'd be white as well, and they would be asking questions that they were, their brain was asking, the questions that would pop into their brain. And then Jane Goodall came onto the scene and she was not bearded. Um, and she had a different set of questions because of her own experiences in life um, that were based on the fact that she was of a different gender and so she'd had different societal kind of expectations and different um, experiences because of her gender. And so whereas the males had been previously only considering that there might be a hierarchy within the males of the monkeys and apes, Jane Goodall was like, and the females were just completely uh, kind of submissive to all of this. Jane was like, well, I don't think that's true. I think the females probably have a similar hierarchical system as well. And um, I don't think they're just submissive. They probably uh, kind of initiate some of the sexual activity uh, and maybe have their own relationships that the males aren't aware of. And so she started looking for the first time ever in this field of primatology and asking different questions. And she got some astounding results, really interesting results. And so that's just an, an um, kind of a um an idea that you know you can have because of your experiences as a person you have different questions um and so if you're trying to accrue the right team then really you want people that have had different experiences throughout their life maybe because of racism or because of sexism um, and they will ask different questions there's also some fascinating research that's coming out on in looking at how our brains change as we age so during the typical lifespan so we talked earlier about the brain for the for the baby as it emerges from the womb with these eight to six billion nerve cells that have been kind of wired up as for the foundation of thought and then um, new connectivity uh, occurring throughout life but at a really fast pace for the first few years of life all the way up to well 10 really but particularly for the first three years of life and then there's this really interesting period of brain development which has only recently been accepted so professor sarah jane blakemore who works at now she's at cambridge university but she was at ucl um, she kind of helped to spearhead this area of neurobiology that's looking at the adolescent brain and this critical period of plasticity here. So during the adolescent brain, so that's from 10 years old all the way actually until the mid twenties, um, is this very distinct phase of brain development. 
And it's during this adolescent phase that you're getting high amounts of um, myelination, so the fat wrapping itself around those nerve cells so that the electrical impulses can start to fire with much faster integrity and not losing um, signal. So it's at this phase of development that you're really creating those motorways, those highways of the mind where electric signals can really zip along to create behaviors uh, that can be enacted really quickly. So you're now creating these habits and thoughts during this phase of development and that's occurring at a high rate. Also, you're getting synaptic pruning. So basically any uh, kind of connections that have been not used or not used on a regular basis get snipped away in much the same way that you'd prune a bush. And so you're really sculpting and honing that brain during this adolescent period. And you're also still getting high amounts of plasticity. So new connections forming um, during this 10, 15 year period. So, um, Teenagers or brains that are adolescent all the way up to the mid 20s um, have they're associated with having um, a slightly higher risk taking uh, predisposition because of the way that the myelin um, kind of wraps itself around at different rates within different circuits. But also because of this plasticity and this pruning, there's huge amounts of innovation and creativity potential within that adolescent brain. As we age, and as we get older and older, um, some of that innovative creative ability gets slightly decreased. So our, um, our intelligence in terms of how much information, our wisdom that we know, our um, kind of is called crystallized intelligence, actually increases and keeps increasing as we learn more from the environment. But the rate at which our fluid intelligence, so the way that we can think and problem solve, actually starts to kind of slow down and even decline. Um, and something really interesting happens as well from the mid 30s, 40s, we start to place a different weighting on how our brains operate. So we start to use less information from the outside world and instead start to rely more on what's already within our brain, the information that's there already. And as a strategy, this seems sensible because actually also our bodies are kind of starting to fail on ourselves. So we've learned more information from our years of experience that we've accrued from life, um, but also our ears and our um, eyes might be starting to fail. So it makes sense to start to shift the ratio by which we make predictions about the world so that it's more based on our experiences rather than the here and the now. Um, so you could say that as we age, uh, our brains become more refined and we have more um, capability for wisdom. Um, but during the, during the adolescent period, there's, there is more capability for innovative, creative problem solving. And even a younger brain um, kind of makes less assumptions about the world as well. Um, so they see the world more as it is. Um, because they haven't had, had those layers of assumptions from years on, of lived experiences altering the way that they create their representation of reality. So a family of people that spans different generations creates a great team because of the way that they have different brain profiles based on their ages. Um, so when you're recruiting uh, for work or for friendship group or for any committee, maybe your local community committee, again, think about how you can recruit to make the most of genetic experience and age diversity. And there's another key thing here as well to make pull the most out of our cognitive power, which might be limited or predisposed in some way, um, and that's to avoid dominance dynamics. So there's some lovely studies showing that within any group of people, um, say you've got a group of four people, um, then two of them, the most dominant two, will do 62% of the talking. If you increase the number of people in the group uh, to say six people, then three of them, again half of them, the more dominant half, will do over 70% of the talking. And the problem becomes increasingly worse as you increase the size of the group. So the dominant people that are uh, driven to communicate and talk over other people will uh, get progressively more um, vocal. 
and uh, subdue um, any of the ideas that you might be able to accrue from the other half of the group. So what can you do to help stop this so-called dominance dynamic so that you can start to harness the cognitive power that's on offer from the whole of the team? Well, there's some lovely studies looking at, for example, how um, simple things like brain writing. So instead of brainstorming and talking about ideas that you might have, but anonymously writing down ideas, within a meeting can actually increase uh, the, the number, firstly, the number of ideas that are generated, but also when independently assessed, increased the um, value uh, of the ideas. There were better ideas that were being suggested from this brain, anonymous brain writing. Also flipping hierarchies around, so the most junior members are actually heading teams, uh, kind of seems to stop this problem of dominance dynamics and people just sheep like following the leader in terms of what they're thinking. Um, and then there's also ideas of, um, for example, uh, Jeff Benzos has um, a structure within his organisation. So for the first few minutes of a meeting, everybody has entire silence and they just sit and read documents and think. And then they might start suggesting ideas for any problems that have been offered but get, again flipping hierarchies so the most junior person goes first so there's some good tricks for avoiding dominance dynamics so that you are getting uh, some of the brain power that's on offer um, from your team um, I want to just really quickly uh, talk about how moral values can be contagious um, so within any group of people, you can uh, get a hive mind that goes down to the dark side and acts in really morally corrupt ways. Um, and unfortunately, this seems to be a, 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 a trait which has been seen again and again throughout uh, species history. And there's some lovely studies that have emerged from Francesca Gino's lab. Um, I think she's at Harvard University. She's looked at when she's implanted uh, an actor into a group of people that are trying to problem solve together. And the actor has been told to behave in a way that is morally corrupt. Then what generally will happen is that that group will veer towards acting in a way that is morally corrupt. So they'll start cheating in tests or they'll start um, kind of trying to sabotage another group's um, progress. So it just takes one person, one unknown person to infiltrate a group and then veer that group down this morally corrupt um, way of behaving. And there's some lovely work that's come out of Ray Dolan's uh, lab at UCL and also Molly Crockett's lab at um, Yale University. Um, and they've looked at how once you're, you've undergone a morally corrupt act then your brain actually shifts it changes the sensitivity of the striatum so that's an area of the brain that's involved in reward and motivation and decision making and um, kind of bringing in the social circuit uh, as well so moral behavior and what happens is its sensitivity changes so that you start to become once you've um, uh, undergone one immoral act then actually you start to just think okay well it's fine i can just continue going down that path towards more dark and depraved acts so once you've set off and that on that path then it can be more enticing to continue down it because of your brain biology which is quite worrying so what can we all do to try and protect ourselves from the contagious power of moral corruption um, well, there's some lovely studies, uh, again, looking at how, although immoral behaviour can be contagious, so can positive morals and positive behaviour. So, for example, it's known that if um, things like well-being, so if your neighbour or your best friend, as long as they live within one kilometre of you, if they are happy and they're having a good period in life, then it's known that that will statistically be likely to impact on your own happiness levels. Really interestingly, there was less of an effect with the partner that you lived with. So there seems to be some mechanism within the brain so that you become resilient to any contagious effect of mood from your partner. And I suppose that makes sense because you're constantly being exposed to them. And so you don't want to just con like, you know, constantly be buffeted around by each other's emotions. And that actually you need to get some resilience and some sense of self. Otherwise, you would just well, you could cascade into um, a pit of misery, couldn't you? <laughs> 
or a pit of pleasure. I don't know. Um, so that's a, so. But so you seem to have more immunity to uh, any spouse that you're living with. But you are affected by your neighbours' happiness levels and your best friend's happiness levels if you have close contact with them, which is lovely. So what is it about um, kind of this contagious value? Is there anything that we can start to do to infiltrate it or to try and tweak it to help us so that we behave with more moral integrity? Well, there's some lovely, uh, and exactly, Danny, and also you'd be unable to support your par partner if you were being hypersensitive um, to their emotional needs. Um, yes, Amy, there, so I can, uh, so this, the, the studies are, I think it's if your partner is happy, you're more likely to be happy. The contagion value of um, your spouse that you're living with is about 8% compared with a best friend or a neighbour where it gets to 32% and 16%. So there's a significant difference there in the emotions. Um, okay, so, you, so there is a, there's a biological, there's some reason why you, you want your partner to be happy because it will have an effect on you but you know um, you don't have to be worried too much about it because you do have some resilience you're not going to mirror all of their emotions which is quite good um, okay so there's other ways that we can protect um, against positive power and that's by just simply smiling at each other so taking the time to smile at other people um, and uh, act with gratitude and compassion so taking a moment to um, kind of taking a moment to just think about what you've appreciated in your day or to notice acts of kindness or compassion exhibited by other people. That's been shown to change the balance of activity in different circuits of the brain so that we activate more pro-social, kind of friendly, positive circuits within the brain rather than these more depraved, immoral act circuits uh, that we don't want to be activating. Um, and I've got a slide there of a vaccine that's being, and I'm not entirely sure what that's for. I'm sorry. I think there's a way that you can start to inoculate, inoculate yourself. Um, this idea, this concept that you can inoculate yourself with positivity. And I think it's again, going back to this idea that you can, if you take time to notice awe from the environment and ha have gratitude and compassion, it seems to help inoculate you against any immoral acts that other people or negative emotions that other people might be exposing you to. So it's taking back that power um, by taking time um, to notice some of the positive things in the environment around you rather than the negative ones. Um, I want to also touch on what happens in terms of if you're exposed to fear or stress from your environment and how that can affect your behavior. Um, and obviously this happens to different people to differing degrees and that can be based on their brain biology. But still this environmental uh, kind of um, exposure to fear or stress has effects on the brain plasticity because of the very nature of the fact that our brains are plastic and can change as a result of the environment. So a little bit of stress can actually be good it can actually enhance through the effects of adrenaline it can actually enhance the flexibility and the dynamism within the brain and increase that plasticity so that we can start to learn more quickly uh, and make memories more quickly in in response to our environmental changes so a little bit of stress can actually be a positive thing on the brain so bdnf angela is brain derived neurotrophic factor and it's this lovely chemical uh, which basically helps to um, cultivate new and protect new connections that form within the mind as we learn from our environment. Um, and it also acts as, it's almost like a compost for the brain or this kind of um, feeding manure uh, that's in the chemical form on the brain. And it's released when we do things like exercise, for example. Um, and some people are genetically predisposed to express higher amounts of this lovely chemical than others. Um, and so they are more resilient to any negative effects of mental ill health because they, they have this um, higher level of BDNF, which allows them to have a more flourishing brain. And exercise, as I said earlier, is very good for the brain and for increasing this BDNF level. And what exercise also does is it allows new nerve cells to be born in the hippocampus, which is the brain region of the brain that's involved in learning and memory and navigating the environmental space around us. So making, being able to form new perceptions of the world based on our experiences and being able to then navigate our virtual space uh, and our lives as a result of that learnt experience. So 
the, um, what they found is that um, we have levels of neurogenesis, so this birth of new nerve cells occurring in the dentate gyrus, the region of the hippocampus, and that occurs throughout life. But as we get older, this level of neurogenesis seems to decrease and decline, especially if we're um, a, a result of stress. So stress can help to decrease the amount of neurogenesis. But if we have high levels of BDNF from exercise, and if we're exercising, then the birth of new nerve cells can continue to occur throughout our lives. Um, and we want that BDNF there. So chronic stress can not only kill connections that are occurring in the brain, it can also decrease that BDNF level that's being expressed, and it can kill nerve cells off in the brain as well. So you're starting to get a less populated brain with less connectivity and less dynamism. So less able to respond to the world around um, as it changes in a positive way. And so what we're seeing here in this um, graph is stress causing less connectivity on the nerve cells and less dendritic branching as well. So you're seeing that here. And this is the um, chemical formulation for that beautiful chemical called brain derived neurotrophic factor, which helps to cultivate those new nerve cells in the brain, helps them to integrate within the existing circuitry and to allow connections to flourish so that you can learn from your environment and start to think in new positive ways rather than, for example, ruminating on negative things that might have occurred during your life before. So this BDNF level is really crit critical. Um, stress also. Uh, so Dan is asking what increases BDNF. Um, so if you're predisposed to be expressing high levels of BDNF, that's great. Uh, if you're not, then again, exercise can help um, increase your levels of BDNF. And there's some studies that indicate that there's certain foods that are implicated in BDNF um, expression, but I can't remember exactly. You'll be able to find that out. Um, and the studies, I, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how conclusive they are, um, but certainly exercise. Um, uh, and there's also something called hot and cold cognition. So the more stressed you are, the more your um, hot and cold cognition gets thrown out of whack, whack, which causes the amygdala, the area of the brain that I was talking about earlier, involved in the fear response to become hyperactivated and hypervigilant. And that's at the expense of the anterior cingulate cortex, which is problem solving into the future, which explains why people that are exceedingly stressed, um, it's almost as if their brain has been frozen from the fear because their amygdala is in hyperactive states. And so they can't think their way, they literally can't think their way out of that problem that's occurring in the environment um, and, and, and reach out to other people to try and innovatively solve the problem and look towards the future. Um, so this is why it's so important that we try and take some time to manage our stress levels and to exercise and to practice gratitude and compassion and some of these introspective activities to pick up on cues that our body might be processing, uh, but we would otherwise not be consciously aware of um, in order to make sure that these negative effects of fear and stress from the outside world uh, don't profoundly impact our brain health into the future. Um, and then very finally, um, how do we try and create an environment that allows us to try and harness the cartography of the brain that's on offer from all of the people around us, whether it's our family groups or our um, kind of residential groups of people that are living in a street uh, together or our friendship groups or the people that we work with. Um, so there's some lovely studies that are looking at how we create so-called seniors. So an environment that triggers collective genius. And again, we're going back to that idea of running um, or exercise. So any exercise that you can do as a group activity that's in some way synchronized. So for example, running marathons have been really uh, kind of popular over recent years, but rowing, for example, or even things like um, singing in a choir where people are singing in synchronicity. What you can see that that does is it actually um, uh, yeah, dark chocolate for BDNF, which is always lovely, isn't it? I like to hear that. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> um, so, um, so, uh, so anything that helps uh, people to be acting in unison or synchronous synchrony actually doesn't help just their bodies to work in synchrony, but their brain waves start to oscillate in synchronicity as well. So, at any point. Our brains are taking in information from the outside world, but we're not actually taking in information as a continuous reel. 
we're taking snapshots of information from the outside world and then our brain stitches it together to create the perception of a continuous real. And what researchers have found is that if we look each other in the eye, and this can't occur over video screens, but it has to be in person. And if we're doing activities um, such as synchronized running or singing together or rowing, for example, then that helps that process of brain synchronicity so that we start to see the world in literally the same time point. And that, that synchronicity between the electrical oscillations in our brain creates almost a super brain cloud that enhances learning and memory and consens consensus building between individuals. Um, <clears throat> and there's another lovely little fact as well that I kind of want to really quickly, because I'm aware of time, we need to close on. Um, and that's uh, it's going back to this idea of dominance dynamics. So there were some lovely studies that were looking at how you could climb a mountain uh, successfully and reach the peak of the mountain without killing off as many members as possible or, or all of you dying before you get to the top of the mountain and what they found is that those uh, countries that had a much more authoritarian kind of dominant uh, dynamic uh, kind of ideology um, were much more likely to uh, give rise to death by the time that they um, before reaching the top of the mountain and that's because some of the other groups, members of the team, uh, weren't feeling confident enough to share the information from their perspective, from their cartography of their brain with the rest of the team. And so the team as a whole was missing information because they weren't able to share the fated way that each of those individuals were perceiving the world in real time. And so those countries that had that much more totalitarian authoritarian uh, kind of ideology created this communication style which meant that essentially the team as a whole were much more likely to die before they reached the top of the mountain um, and so this is kind of where i want to end this talk is that group think yeah is that um you know each of us might have a a predetermined way of seeing the world and reacting to it and we might have some idiosyncrasies and flaws we might also have some strengths um, but really the true power of our brains only comes to something uh, fruitful when we try to harness the breadth of cognitive diversity that the cartography of our brain can offer through these 86 trillion connections that shift um, as we go through our lives um, and in that, I'd love to take any questions that you might have. Hey, Hannah, that was a brilliant presentation. I wasn't expecting the two separate parts, so that was, um, yeah, really interesting. So thank you very much. We've had quite a few questions. Um, Oh, okay, so the original lab has done this um, study and they found that if you take the original grandparents that were exposed to the mild electric shock um, and, uh, and um, instead of pairing it with the mild electric shock, you go through many iterations of giving them a nice sweet treat instead with the smell of cherries, then over time, over quite a few iterations, you can replace that memory, that traumatic memory. And then you can stop that traumatic memory being passed down the generations. But what they found is that it's important to do it for the original person that's been affected. So um, they found it more difficult to change the memory for the descendants. And they also said that it took quite a few iterations to replace the memory. So there's a residue of that trauma that remains and it takes quite a lot of work to erase it. Now, really interestingly, there's a team in China, I think it is, and also a team in England in Cambridge that are working on how we can, you know, the film Eternal Sunshine on a Spotless Mind, how you can actually erase memories, traumatic memories within individuals. Um, and there's a drug called propan, pro, I, okay, I can never say it properly, pro, propanol, which is normally for a heart condition. Um, and there's been some, um, pretty compelling research looking at how if you give propanol, propanol uh, at the same time as revisiting a traumatic memory in human populations, you can start to um, 
you you're basically accessing so you so you get the person and say maybe they're a soldier that's returned from afghanistan and they've got ptsd um so anything like the smell of bitumen will trigger this horrific memory from their past um and they'll have flashbacks from it and, and it'll you know completely um, affect their decision making uh, and their emotions so what you do is you give them the smell of um, bitumen and at the same time you give this and so that makes the memory of this traumatic event labile it's something called labile so it's being activated by the bitumen by this olfactory cue and then you give the drug propanol and it will basically target specifically only the labile memories that are being activated at that point and break it and so the idea is that you can chemically induce an erasure of a specific memory. So there's some quite interesting, thank you, Amy. It's, I, can't, I still can't say it. It's propanolol. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah. So, there, so there's some fascinating research that's going on. Um, yeah, EMDR has also been to found, found to be quite helpful. And ketamine, and there's some, also some studies looking at MDMA, MDMA um, and psychedelics. So, oh, so psychedelic, there's some... Um, that's kind of bleak in terms of the generations yeah so danny that's a good point um uh, i th i personally think that if you so all of the atrocities that have occurred to indigenous populations across the world um you know and i've just come back from australia where as far into the 60s and 70s 1960s and 70s um they were taking aboriginal children and um forcing them to go and live in uh white houses to try and, and to reproduce with them to try and dilute the um the uh the aboriginal kind of population and to, to change the color of them it's called the stolen generations um and it's there's at least thirty thousand people in australia uh now living now who've been affected by this but it's probably many 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 more um but they're not talking about it quite so much but these are tra absolutely atrocious things have happened across the world um, and I think as we find out more about the biological impact this trauma has, I think there's going to be some really, um, I think it's going to have some legal repercussions, or it, sh it certainly should have some legal, legal repercussions. Um, there's a really interesting podcast by Obama, um, chatting to Bruce Springsteen on Spotify, where they're talking about um, just the, the legislative uh, kind of impact of this and, you know, what the possibilities might be. Anyway, they don't talk about the epigenetics, but they do <laughs> talk about the kind of like the, the legal legacy from all of these results. <laughs> Oh, I really wanted to talk about LSD, if that's okay. Um, so there's some wonderful research that's conducted. Um, largely, it's been David Nutt, who's at Imperial College London. He used to be the um, scientific advisor for the drug um, kind of cabinet within uh, the government. And he got basically forced resignation um, because he was saying that alcohol is um, actually more dangerous statistically than ecstasy. But he also, um, he really wanted to do some research on the power of psychedelics. Um, but really as a result of um, the CIA in America and, and lots of other kind of past instances where they tried to use psychedelics for group like mind control, there were some really negative connotations with the power of psychedelics um, in terms of helping people. And so none of the um, government funded agencies, agencies would fund any basic research or clinical research looking at how psychedelics could help, could have therapeutic benefit. And so what David Nutt did, um, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I think it was, is he used the power of communication and democracy and the internet to um, start a crowdfunded um, study on the power of psychedelics and it was the first of its kind so he was able to do fmri so looking at how le different levels of oxygen rush to different areas of the brain um, to correspond with um, metabolic activity across the brain um, so it's the first of a study of its time having to be having to be funded in order for it to occur by the general public who are interested in how psychedelics could help therapeutically different people and how what their mode of action was because the governments just were refusing to study it despite neuroscientists lobbying for many many years and so what he found was that actually it reverts the brain into a more of a naive childlike state so I was talking earlier about the child brain having this plasticity, but not having had that layers of assumptions um, in information processing being built up in the brain from past experiences. And those layers of assumptions can give rise to 
traumatic responses to particular triggers and it can also create people that ruminate in a negative way they've got into a very bad habit of thinking in a negative way and they found that these psychedelics can revert the brain into this beautiful plastic naive childlike state and it can help people to start breaking those negative associations so that they can start thinking and building pathways that think more positively into the future yeah, there's some really interesting studies on the power of meditation and um, Cambridge University conducted a really big study looking at um, first year undergraduates who were quite um, unfortunately prone to stress as a result of the um, kind of high paced um, stressful environment that they're in and they found that meditation seemed to help boost their resilience um, and there's some lovely studies looking at how it can change brain waves so that they become slightly slower um, and more relaxed associated with more relaxation but there's and, and there's also some studies i think looking at neurogenesis and how meditation can affect neurogenesis that birth of new nerve cells in the brain but there's also some studies looking at how a lot of meditation can actually increase egocentricity so you're spending so much time meditating thinking about these your <laughs> like immersed in your own world that you're conjuring up that actually it can sometimes have a negative consequence <laughs> so, uh, yeah so uh, yeah I, it's not really my area of expertise um but yeah there's definitely lots of studies there um i'm trying to think there's some wonderful studies looking at buddhist monks uh and how their brain waves particularly gamma waves which are very fast brain waves um almost if you imagine your brain is making electrical oscillations like a symphony and there's like kind of slow rhythmic drumming which happens when you sleep as well um but then there's maybe a flute that's dancing around kind of all over the place and actually um buddhist monks have quite a lot of the flute that's skipping around all of the, over the place and that's helping to integrate the neural circuitry across the whole brain region so that you're able to integrate information from all the different regions because you've got that high amount of gamma waves. And interestingly, um, people with schizophrenia have a lower uh, gamma wave activity, which might be why they experience delusions or hallucinations. Um, there's been some interesting studies looking at belief change um, from some guys in the States. And what they found is that people of any ideological belief system has have entrenched beliefs and they will only see aspects of the external world that they want to see and so it's not like you know entrenched beliefs hamper just one type of person it's spread across the continuum and the more that those beliefs are embedded within our social networks or our everyday lives the more difficult it is to change those beliefs. Um, so there's some really interesting work that's happening with the behavioral insights team that work with the government. So that's the, they're called the nudge team and they try to nudge people's, it sounds a little bit like manipulation and they are, they're trying to nudge people's behaviors in different ways. So they've um, looked at, um, They've looked at different things, for example, how can you get people to insulate their lofts a little bit better? And uh, the way to do that is to offer somebody to come and um, clear out the loft so that then, and also offer financial rewards um, for uh, kind of installing the loft insulation. So it's kind of taking out that step uh, that makes it difficult for people to do. So that's good for climate change kind of research, um, for example. But if you think about, propaganda throughout history um then always there's been this case that far-right organizations have worked on trying to change the brain you know whether you know before maybe we didn't realize that this is how it was happening but it was changing the brain profile of um the population by instilling fear and anxiety in them so that they were thinking more of protectionism short-term protectionism for themselves for their themselves as an individual rather than thinking in the wider term and the longer term and it's because that hot and cold cognition that i was talking about earlier as a result of the fear and the stress from the environment has got out of whack so i think we do have to be mindful of how we are all susceptible to manipulation from the environment as a result of this brain plasticity. Oh, 
Yeah, so again, the key things that we can do to help look after our brain as we get into the older age um, is to exercise, um, to keep that neurogenesis occurring in the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus, the hippocampus, so we get new nerve cells being born throughout life so that we can keep on forming new memories and uh, have, have that uh, ability for new um, connections to occur within our brain. Um, from these new cells, um, but also uh, socialising. So making sure that we go out. So there's some lovely studies by the government. The main person who's done this research is this um, guy at Caltech called Rusty Gage, Professor. I can't remember what his real name is. Fred Gage. Fred Gage. Um, and he's this really Ameri He's a really cool guy. And uh, he did some studies, ooh, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago, of some mice. And they were, some of them had free access to a running wheel and some of them didn't and they were just in a cage all by themselves. And basically what he found was that the more a mouse could freely run and could happily run and then also explore the environment and had like a lovely, lovely um, kind of cage that had lots of levels, lots of scope to interact with lots of other mice. Um, and it could explore kind of, there was lots of little games that it could do and there was lots out there in its world to interact with basically. Um, then what happened was the exercise, the running wheel, and the runners scampering around help these new nerve cells to be born in the hippocampus at a faster rate. And the more that the mice were then also able to interact with an exciting environment and meet lots of other mice, the more that those new nerve cells would fully integrate and form functional connections and circuits with other nerves within the existing circuit. Um, and so that would give rise to a more flourishing brain. And those results seem to have followed through to human studies. Um, so basically, if we continue to exercise into our older age and we also explore the environment around us and talk to lots of different people that might have different perspectives and different beliefs then it keeps our plasticity labile and it keeps it active and so that's good for our brain and then in terms of health healthy eating anything that's good for our heart is a good rule i think this is anything that's good for our hearts is going to be good for our brain because our brains require, as I said earlier, 20% of our daily energy quota. So they need lots of oxygen and they need the heart to be pumping blood around with lots of oxygen in it so that it can reach our brain so that we can keep up the metabolic demands of those um, new nerve cells. So eat, eat, uh, eat for your heart and um, uh, keep socially active and physically active for your brain as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, so I looked at, um, during my PhD, I was looking at the effects of isolation on rats, um, rats that were being brought up in isolation and taken away from um, interacting with lots of other rats and how that would cause decreases in connections, um, dendritic spines within the brain. And part of the reason that, um, I mean, my flights back from Australia were cancelled anyway. Um, they kept on getting cancelled, but I, you know, I could have tried harder to get a flight back. And I just looked at Britain and the way that it was, this is a bit, I'm being a bit negative now, but I, you know, I looked at the way that um, the government was responding to this and I saw primary schools being closed. Um, and I've got a young son who was starting school for the very first time at this time. And he's an only child and it's just me and him. And I was thinking, you know, there is no way based on what I know about the effects of isolation on the brain that I want him to not go to school. Um, you know, so I, I, you know, I think it's important that he gets that environmental enrichment and he learns from his peers. Um, and I know that it's good for his brain health. And so I kind of stayed put in Queensland, where the premier there, so the Australian government has a very different um, structure to our political system. So there's Scotty, the prime minister, but then within each state, there's a very independent premier who basically doesn't listen to what Scotty says and does what they want to do. And the Queensland premier was this amazing woman and she just basically closed the borders brutally and, um, uh, and had mini lockdowns. But as a result of her measures, there was no COVID in the whole of our shire. You know, they analyzed, um, thousands of people, they looked at the sewage system and COVID basically didn't enter. Um, the schools were only closed for five days during Max's education and so, and, and the community groups were open, the playgrounds were open um, and, and things were on a day-to-day -day level pretty much uh, the same as they were. And I'm sure, you know, there were financial repercussions because tourism just went but, um, but I think personally that if you're looking, if you've got a longer term approach and you're thinking about future generations, 
um, and you're using your anterior cingulate cortex rather than your amygdala, it's much more important that the schools are being kept open and that those community groups are being kept open so that people can maintain their mental health um, and their brain health into the future. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.